Let's just pray first. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that uh, for your Sabbath. And Father, we just ask that as we go through your word and we learn and we hear, that you would do a work in our hearts, that you would help us understand. Give us understanding, our way. Help us to understand your word and to apply it to our lives. And we thank you for your word, for we know it is truth 100%. In the name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen. So today we are going to talk about, and it has already been brought up today. <laughs> the remnant. We're going to be talking about the remnant. We know the Bible talks about a remnant of people. The question is, who is the remnant? What makes them the remnant? And how are they identified? The remnant. A lot of people like to talk about the remnant and who that is. Throughout history, there, are, there has always been a remnant. As far as Messianic followers, in the days of Yeshua, they were referred to as of the way in the Bible. Some of you may have read that in the New Testament. They were known, the followers of Yeshua, the disciples of Yeshua, the apostles, were known and referred to as of the way. But there has always been those who follow these same ways throughout history. So from the first century onwards, after the death and after of the of the disciples and after the death of the uh, first century apostles, there has always been somewhere the remnant, and these are the people that follow the same the same ways as they did of the way. And in the brief research I've done on this, they have been in every century since the Messiah. So for the last 2,000 years, there's been a group of these people somewhere on the planet since the days of Messiah, every century. And these include areas of Ireland. There was groups in Ireland, Scotland, England, India, China, which raised my eyebrows a bit, but they were been in China, Africa, throughout just about every country in Europe and also America, there has been a remnant of people that followed the way they did in the first century. I met a man probably two or three years ago. I met a man just randomly, just totally randomly. I met a man and he, he was Indian. And his name was uh, Jonah. And I said to him, well, that means dove in Hebrew. And he said, yeah, yeah. He said, I'm Hebrew. And he was an Indian. And he came from, his, his family were from a tribe in India that had been there for centuries. And he said a lot of his family had gone back to Israel because they're Jewish. Gone back to Israel, and, and but a lot of them have stayed behind because they've got families and and uh, businesses and land and whatnot and and I told him and I had my seat seats on and I said I believe in I said I love the the Hebrew people I love the Jewish people and he just started to weep he, I said I love the feast I love everything about Israel and the land and told him that I went there and all that and he just started to to cry he couldn't he he, he, he couldn't get his head around a Gentile who he was viewing me as a Gentile, he couldn't get his head around somebody that would be like that. Because in his mind, it's only Jewish people are like that. So he was just blown away. Yeah, so India have a, have a big history of, of uh, Jewish tribes and, and Hebrew people. 
so do many other groups throughout the world. So the dictionary meaning of remnant, if you looked it up in just in a normal everyday English dictionary, it describes or explains the word remnant as a fragment or small piece remaining. A small surviving group, often used in the plural. As an example in a sentence, it would be used as sailed home with just a remnant of the colony's population on board. So it's a, it's a piece, it's a, it's a small group of the whole. So that's how the English dictionary renders and explains and describes what a remnant is. So we're going to look at a couple of Hebrew words for remnant. The first one being sherith. Sherith means residue, remnant, remainder, and I like this, it said remaining, remaining in order to complete. So straight away I went to my, my mind went to what the remnant will be in the end days. They, they are remaining to complete. They are there for a purpose, they're going to be there for a reason, to, to complete something. I thought, wow. And also to complement. So maybe the remnant in the time of when Yeshua returns are obviously going to be complementing what he does. They're going to be there for him, to carry out his will and his purpose. So this word Sherith, the first occurrence of this word in our Bibles, in the Hebrew text, is in Genesis 45, 7. And I use this translation, which is the Young's literal translation for this particular verse, as it gave the best interpretation, I thought, and it said, And God sendeth me before you to place you a remnant in the land. So this is talking, Joseph was talking that Yahweh sent him before the rest of them to place you a remnant in the land and to give life to you by a great escape. So we're just talking about the Passover, that was the great escape, the Exodus. But way, way before that, Yahweh sent Joseph before them all to set them up in the land as a remnant. And I thought, wow, this is the first occurrence in our Bibles of a remnant. So a remnant's not a new thing, it's an old thing. Another Hebrew word that's used for the word remnant is yetha. And it, rem it, it means remainder, excess, leaving over, surviving which I thought was interesting. A survivor is one that's left, is a remnant. Uh, cord or stretched ropes. So it basically means what, what remains, what is left. What remains and what's left. So if you have a bowl of bolognese and you leave a bit in your bowl, a bit of pasta, a bit of bolognese, that's the remnant of what you are having. That's what's left. Leftovers. Some of us have leftovers for tea the next night. We have the remnant of what was from the night before. This is the idea of, of this word, what's left, what remains. So the first occurrence of this particular word in our Bibles is from Genesis 30, 36. And this is talking about Jacob and Laban. And it says, then he put three days journey between himself and Jacob. And Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks. So just before this particular verse, this is where they separated the speckled and spotted goats and the brown lambs from the flock. And then that's what happened for, that's what was given to Jacob for his wages. Then after that, they put three days journey between them and Jacob fed the rest of the Laban's flock. The word rest here is remnant. He fed the rest of the flock, what was left over, from taking out the speckled and spotted ones. So right here we see a very good example of how English 
in English, the same word can have a totally different meaning. Rest can also mean to sleep, or to relax, or to chill out. But in this particular context, it means remnant, because it means the rest of something. So this is why context is so important when we're reading our scriptures. Especially when we're reading our English versions, because same words can mean totally different things. And this is a good example of that. A couple of more instances of this Hebrew word yetha is in Genesis thirty-two twenty-four. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. This word left is this word remnant, yetha. And he was literally the remnant, because what did he do before this happened? He sent his wives over to the other side of the creek and he alone was left. He was the remnant of the family. He was alone left by himself. And then we know that he had in this encounter and wrestled with the angel or whoever that being was. He was left alone. He was a remnant. Another instance is in Zechariah chapter 14 verse 16. And this is a prophecy from Zechariah, and it says, And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left, the remnant, everyone who is left of all the nations which come up against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the King, Yahweh of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So obviously this prophecy hasn't happened yet. This is still yet to come to pass. But it's saying that the remnant who is left of all the nations will go up and worship and keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So we know that the feast will be kept after the return of Yeshua. Nothing's changed. God is the same yesterday, today and forever and still requires us to remember the feast. And we know that the feast from this particular passage, that the feast will still be observed and remembered, and we're still to remember them. And who will do that? The remnant. The people that are left. After all the uh, book of Revelation and all that stuff's taken place, and the tribulation and all these things take place, there will be a remnant left from the peoples of the earth. These two Hebrew words that we just went through have very similar meanings and in fact share the same root. They share the same three letter root. The cord or rope is also a meaning for these words. The cord or rope were used to hold up and cause to be upright the tent and the tent walls. So some of us went to Tabernacles last year and we had tent pegs with, tent, with, with cords that held up our tents, that caused our tents to be upright, that supported our tents. This is the same idea, the same cords, the same ropes. We used to hold up and to cause to be upright the tent and the tent walls. They were straight and supported. We are also to be upright straight and we are also to be people who support. This is why I love the Hebrew language. There's so much meaning and so much we can get out of it. Another picture of the remnant is the piece of dough that is pulled, or the piece of bread that is pulled from a loaf to use in the next batch, to use in the next loaf. In the Old Testament, they didn't have yeast. They didn't have dry yeast. Yeast is in the air naturally it's a natural thing that's in the air you can't get away from it so what they used to do to cause their next loaf to rise they would pull a piece out of the old loaf and sit it out and then make a new loaf and put that in and that because it had been risen and affected by yeast that piece that remnant would then cause the next loaf to rise. So that piece that they pulled out from the old loaf 
was called the remnant because it was pulled out from what was from the whole. So it was known as the remnant. So we're going to look at some scripture verses now to do with the word remnant. Those were Hebrew words that we just went through. We're going to go through the English word remnant and look at some of the scriptures to do with this particular word. Isaiah 28, 5. And it says, In that day, Yahweh of hosts will be for a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty to the remnant of his people. Again, these are prophecies that have not taken place yet. This is talking about Yeshua. This is talking about Yahweh in that day. What day? The day of his return when he comes to rule and reign. He will be a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty to the remnant of his people. Isaiah chapter 10, verses 20 to 22. And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as have escaped of the house of Jacob will never again depend on him who defeated them, but will depend on Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. The remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. For though your people, O Israel, be as the sand of the sea, a remnant of them will return. The destruction decree shall overflow with righteousness. So again, this is prophecy. This is yet to come. Talking about a remnant of people from the house of Jacob or from Israel will be unto Yahweh. Isaiah 37, verses 31 to 32. And the remnant who have escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. I like this verse. For out of Jerusalem shall go a remnant, and, and those who escape from Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts, or Yahweh of hosts, will do this. Again, this hasn't happened yet. The remnant, this remnant is all in the future. It's all tied to Messiah and the future. Jeremiah 23, verse 3. But I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their folds and they shall be fruitful and increase. Remember the other week we were talking about the flocks and the good shepherd, how he will gather them from all the nations. That's the remnant. He will gather them from all the countries of the earth where he drove them and he will bring them back. To their folds. Jeremiah 31 7. For thus says Yahweh, sing with gladness for Jacob, and shout among the chief of the nations, proclaim, give praise, and say, O Yahweh, save your people, the remnant of Israel. Micah 2 12. I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob, I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I'll put them together like sheep of the fold, like a flock in the midst of their pasture. They shall make a loud noise because of so many people. So even though there will be a remnant, there will be many people. Because a remnant of the world's population today is a lot of people. So he's going to gather them from all the countries of the earth, and they're going to be a remnant in the fold. So we just read in this particular verse and in the verse before it in Jeremiah said pretty much the same thing, that he would gather them from the nations and cause them to be in one fold. This is another example of a matter being established because it's two or three witnesses. This is definitely going to happen because it's been mentioned twice. It's established. It's going to be happened by the mouth of two or three witnesses. This was declared and spoken of by two different prophets at two different times. So this thing is, is definitely going to happen. He's going to call out the remnant of his people from all the countries of the earth and gather them to his fold. This has messianic things written all over it because Yeshua says 
I will make them of one fold and call them from the nations of the earth. Joel chapter 2 verse 32. This is a, a good one. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of Yahweh shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there, there shall be a deliverance. As Yahweh has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. Now this is, I'm just going to speak a little bit on this particular verse because this is a, a misunderstood verse within Christianity today. This verse is repeated in Acts. And it says, it's repeated by Paul and it says, Those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a direct quote from this particular verse. Many people think that it's those that call on the name of Yeshua. The Bible doesn't say that. It says those that call upon Yahweh. And if you go into the Greek in that particular verse in Acts, in the Greek uh, text, it's Theos. And it's the Yahweh. It's God. It doesn't say those that call upon the name of Yeshua shall be saved. It says those who call upon the name of Yahweh shall be saved. But to us, Yeshua is Yahweh. So it's one of the same thing. So I'm not saying that we're not to call upon the name of Yeshua. Yeshua is Yahweh. Yeshua is God. But the reference is those that call upon the name of Yahweh shall be saved. As it says in this verse, that's what Paul was quoting. It's not the name of Yeshua. It's the name of Yahweh. And we did a teaching many, many months ago about what salvation is. Yahweh is always saving his people. Right from Adam and Eve, all the way through, he continually saves his people. Salvation is not a one-off event. It's a process and you will be saved in the resurrection, if you if you die before Messiah comes back, you will be saved. But that's future tense. It's future. That's why Paul says, work out your salvation daily with fear and trembling. It's not a once saved, always saved meaning. It means you will be saved at some time in the future. There will be a final salvation. But before then, it's a process. So that's a more accurate meaning of calling upon the name of Yahweh. That's what Israel did through their whole history, was call upon Yahweh. They didn't call upon Yeshua, they called upon Yahweh, and he saved them and delivered them every time. The remnant are the ones who Yahweh calls and draws to himself. As we said, the reason why I said that, at the end of that particular verse, in Joel 2.32, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom Yahweh calls. Yahweh calls his remnant. Yahweh calls the people. Yahweh draws people unto himself. In the New Testament it says, Yahweh draws all men to himself. So the remnant are those ones who Yahweh calls and draws to himself. Amos 5.15, it says, hate evil and love good. Establish justice in the gate. It may be that Yahweh, God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. So it says here, hate evil, love good, establish justice in the gate. Those who will walk uprightly, being like the cord or the rope that supports and upholds and up causes the tent to be upright. That's who the remnant should be. Micah, verses 5, 7, 8. Then the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many peoples. That's happening today. There's a remnant that's in the midst of many peoples all over the earth. Like dew from Yahweh, like showers on the grass, that tarry for no man, nor wait for the sons of men. And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles. That's who we are. We're among the Gentiles. 
in the midst of many peoples, like a lion among the beasts of the forest, like a young lion among flocks of sheep, who if he passes through both treads down and tears in pieces, no one can deliver. So the remnant are a people that have power and authority and victory. Why? Because they're in Messiah. They're his people. So I ask you before to turn to your Bibles in Zephaniah 3, starting at verse 13. And it says, The remnant of Israel shall do no unrighteousness, and speak no lies, nor shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. For they shall feed their flocks and lie down, and no one shall make them afraid. Verse 14, Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your judgments. He has cast out your enemy. The King of Israel, Yahweh, is in your midst. You shall see disaster no more. Again, this is a, a prophecy of the future. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear. Zion, let not your hands be weak. Yahweh your God in your midst, the Mighty One, will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. And he will rejoice over you with singing. I will gather those who sorrow over the appointed assembly who are among you to whom its reproach is a burden. Behold, at that time, I will deal with all who afflict you. I will save the lame and gather those who are driven out. I will appoint them for praise and fame in every land where they were put to shame. At that time, I will bring you back. Even at that time, I gather you for I will give you fame and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I return your captives before your eyes, says Yahweh. This is the remnant. This is the remnant. Turn over to uh, Zechariah, which is just a couple of books over. Zechariah 8.11, it says, But now I will not treat the remnant of this people as in the former days, says Yahweh of hosts. For the seed shall be prosperous, the vine shall give its fruit, the ground shall give her increase, and the heavens shall give their due. I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all these. And it shall come to pass that just as you were a curse among the nations, O house of Judah, and O house of Israel, so I will save you, and you shall be a blessing. Do not fear, let your hands be strong. Verse 14. For thus says Yahweh of hosts, just as I determined to punish you when your fathers provoked me to wrath, says Yahweh of hosts, and I would not relent, so again in these days I am determined to do good to Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Do not fear. These are the things you shall do. Speak each man the truth to his neighbour. Giving judgment in your gates, we read this out before in another passage. Give judgment in your gates for truth, justice and peace. Let none of you think evil in your heart against your neighbour and do not have a false oath for all these things I hate, says Yahweh. So these are describing the remnant and how he's going to look after them and provide for them and bless them and they're going to be a blessing among the nations. The remnant. Again, those who walk uprightly. Be like a rope or a cord that causes a tent or a tent wall to be upright. The cords or ropes that are straight. So the remnant are those people. They're straight. They're upright. They speak truth and not evil. So we see we're called to be like those cords that hold up a tent, we're called to be stretched and pulled tight to cause people to be upright. That's who we are, or who we should be. That's the remnant. So I've used a lot of Old Testament passages here. Let's have a look at a New Testament passage. Romans 11, verses 3 to 5. Yahweh, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and I alone 
and left and they seek my life. That word alone is the word we're talking about, remnant. But what does the divine response say to, to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. So this is what Paul was saying, even at this particular time, Yahweh has a remnant of people. And of course, they were the disciples and the apostles in the day. He was using the example in the Old Testament where Yahweh reserved a remnant for himself of 7,000 prophets. He's saying even today, at this present time, there is also a remnant. So if you, in your own time, if you further read, this is in Romans 11, 3 to 5. If you read further down in Romans 11, this is the context. In Romans 11, Paul then goes on to talk about and teach about being grafted in. Paul then goes on and teaches that Gentiles are grafted into the natural olive tree of Israel. Gentiles are referred to in this passage as the wild olive branches. The Gentiles who received Messiah are now grafted into the house of Israel through Yeshua, our Messiah. This is why Paul says there is neither Jew nor Gentile nor free nor slave nor male nor female, which is in Galatians 3.23. If you are in Messiah, which means to be covered, when I say being in Messiah, it means that you are covered and atoned for by the blood of the Lamb. If one calls on the name of Yahweh, you'll be saved. We just read that out. So being in Messiah is being cleansed and forgiven and atoned for and covered by the blood. And then calling upon the name of Yahweh, you will be saved. So this is what Paul is teaching in Romans 11. We're grafted into the house of Israel. We're grafted into the natural olive tree. The natural olive tree is Israel. This is a picture of being grafted in. This is how they do it. This is just an example of what we are, a tangible picture of who we are. We're grafted in to the olive tree. And to back up what I just said is Ephesians 2, verses 11 to 14. Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called, by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ. So when we were Gentiles, we were, out with, we were without Messiah. We were in the world living the way we wanted to live, doing what we wanted to do. We were without Messiah, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Messiah Yeshua, you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Messiah. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. So he has made us one with Israel. The blood of Messiah has made us one, has grafted us into the house of Israel. This is what Paul was referring to being grafted into the natural olive tree. You were a Gentile, but now you are a Hebrew. You are, you are an Israelite. In Yahweh's eyes, you're an Israelite. You have become a Hebrew and Israelite, a citizen of the commonwealth of Israel. You are no longer a Gentile. There is no house of the Gentiles. There is no Christianity. There is no Judaism. There is no philosophies. There are those who follow the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And that's it. His ways and his laws, or his Torah. That's, that's how simple it is. There is no Christianity, there's no Baptist, there's no 
charismatics, there's no Lutherans, there's no Catholics in the kingdom of God. There's those that follow the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. There's no Sadducees, there's no Pharisees, there's no Greek philosophers, there's no Buddhism, there's no Shintoism, there's no none of the other world religions. There's only the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. That's the only way. That's all there is. And his Torah and his laws. Romans 9.27 He's quoting a a passage we read out earlier, which was in Isaiah 10.22. This is a direct quote from that same passage. Paul says, Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. He's speaking of Israel. He's quoting directly from Isaiah 10.22, which is what we read earlier. But what also needs to be understood is that not all Israel is Israel. Not all Israel is Israel. Paul quotes this in another part of the New Testament. Just because you're an ethnic Israeli or an ethnic Jew doesn't mean you're saved. You have to be a Messiah. Because we read, we explained in the passage in Romans chapter 11 that the natural branches get broken off. The natural branches are those who are of Israel. If they don't choose Messiah, if they don't follow Yeshua, they get broken off. But then they also have the opportunity to be regrafted back in if they choose Messiah. Not all Israel is Israel. It says it in Romans 11. I encourage you to read the whole passage. So to answer our question from the beginning, who is the remnant? What makes them the remnant and how are they identified? As we have clearly seen in many scriptures, there is only the house of Israel in the end. The scriptures talk about the remnant being directly connected to the house of Israel. There is no house of the Gentiles. There is no house of Christianity. There is no house of Judaism. There's no house of philosophies. There is one house, and that is the house of Israel. The remnant are those who are in Messiah Yeshua, those that call upon the name of Yahweh, those who yield, humble, and submit themselves to Yahweh and his commandments. For Yeshua himself said in John 14, 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. There is only one set of commandments, which is called the Torah. What needs to be understood is when Yeshua declared this statement, If you love me, you shall keep my commandments, the New Testament was not even written. The New Testament was not even written when he declared this statement. And he himself said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Matthew 7, 23. This is again Yeshua. And he says, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. There are many who are without law, or in other words, without the Torah. If you want to know how to love him, keep his law and his Torah. We just read it out. If you love me, keep my commandments. Matthew 7, verses 13 to 14. Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way that leads to life. And there are few who find it. The few who find it sounds like a remnant to me. A remnant are a small group of people. The ones who find the gate. The ones who find him. 
They're the, they're the remnant. They're the ones that endure to the end. They're the ones that run the race and get the prize. Because it's saying in this exact verse that it's a difficult way. There's many people that start on a journey, but there's many people that don't finish the journey. They get let off for whatever reason, and the, and the reasons are numerous. There are a few, there are a remnant that will endure to the end. So let's close on this. Let me put it very simply. Those who follow Yahweh and His ways, the Torah, and are cleansed and atoned for by the Yeshua Messiah are the remnant. They are grafted into Israel by the grace and mercy of Yahweh. Grace does not mean you don't have to do the commandments anymore. Grace allows us to be reconciled and atoned for so we can love Yeshua and Yahweh by doing the commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. That's what grace is. It allows us to be atoned for. It allows us to be reconciled. It allows us to be redeemed. So we can keep the commandments. So we can follow Yeshua. That's what grace is. So we're no longer Gentiles. We're no longer Australians. We're no longer English. We're no longer Indians. We are Hebrews. We are Israelites. We are the remnant. I'll finish on this. I am a Hebrew. And Hebrew means one that has crossed over. I have crossed over from man-made traditions and lies, man-made traditions and lies into biblical truth. So that's who we are. That's who the remnant are. They're the ones who have crossed over from man-made traditions and lies into biblical truth. So if you want to know who the remnant are and what they will be, that's these very people. The ones that will follow Yahweh, the ones that are righteous, the ones that are in Messiah. It's got nothing to do with a denominational church. It's got nothing to do with a movement. It's got nothing to do with a philosophy or a religion. It's got purely to do with you and him and whether you choose to follow him or not. But as for me and my house, we will serve Yahweh. So if people ask me who I am, I'm a Hebrew. I'm an Israelite. I follow the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I also follow Yeshua the Messiah. That's who a true remnant is. Let's just pray. Father, I pray that you help us understand who you want us to be, who you've called us to be, who you've asked us to be. Father, I thank you that you're opening our eyes, you're helping our understanding. Father, I pray for each and every one of us that we would be the remnant, that we would be there in the end, that we would endure to the very end and be the remnant that we just learned about in your scriptures. Father, help us to be those people. Help us to be the remnant and we, that we would find ourselves in your fold. Father, we want you to be our shepherd, for we know that you are the good shepherd. Father, we want to put ourselves on the potter's wheel and be moulded and transformed and shaped into the remnant. Father, help us to be those people. Help us to be a people that represent you and your ways to the best of our ability. Help us not to be a people that compromise, but to be like those tent cords that are straight and strong, that cause uprightness. Help us to be an upright, righteous people. Thank you, Yahweh. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your word. Your word is truth. Help us to be the people that stay on the narrow path Father, we want to be part of the few that find it. Help us to be those people. And Father, where we're struggling, help us to reach out to you and to each other 
and find support, for that's what the remnant does. A remnant supports one another. Help us to be those people, Yahweh. In Yeshua's name, Amen. Thank you for watching. We pray that this teaching has been a blessing to you. For more information, please go to www.ancientfoundationbiblefellowship.com. Shalom.